Can somebody clap their hands and give God praise? For well, this is the day the Lord has made, and we are rejoicing. We are glad to be in it. Welcome this Sunday morning to Destiny Cathedral. Come on, let's give our worship team a good round of applause. Then they do wonderful today. I love those selections. I, amen. Brought us right into the spirit of the season. Amen. God is so good. And you're looking so pretty today, so beautiful. Destiny Cathedral has started Christmas early this year. We started decorating earlier. And uh, we, we are going to be having Christmas. We started Christmas, of course, today with our music. We are going to be taking Christmas over to the May Fair this afternoon. And uh, we're going to bring some joy to the residents there. Amen. I trust that all of you will be able to make it over there. Amen. We want to bring some excitement, the joy of the season to the, both the, the workers uh, the, and the, res the staff and the, res and the residents there at the Mayfair. And uh, we're going to be continuing Christmas in a big way next week, Sunday evening. At what time? Every time we change our schedules, someone calls and says, oh, I didn't know, you know. What time is service next week? Wonderful. We're having a special musical celebration next Sunday evening at 4 p.m. Do not come at 11 in the morning. Some, we, some folks told us, Pastor, we're going to miss this 11 o'clock session. That's okay. That's okay. You can visit another church at 11 if you care to. Or you can finish your shopping, or your cooking, or your cleaning, whatever you want to do. But be here next Sunday at 4 p.m. Amen. And then we're going to continue Christmas the next weekend, amen, with our family time. And not only family, we want to invite everyone. All of you are invited. We're having a special potluck son, a Christmas celebration, all kinds of food. It's going to be wonderful right here in Jubilee Hall. The temperature is going to be good. The tables are going to be laid. And I'm going to come with my appetite. Amen. And I understand we're going to have some special, very special guests and entertainment that afternoon as well. Praise the Lord. And, and of course, on New Year's Eve, at, uh, on the 31st of December, we're going to come back the next day at what time? 10 p.m. Wow, our people are right on point. 10 p.m. All right. If you want to come earlier, that's all right. But make sure you come when the service is going to begin right on the dot at 10 p.m. If you notice, we have a countdown here because we have folks on, on YouTube who are joining us. And we want to be on time for them. So we will be here at 10 p.m. And we're going to want to make sure that we begin the new year right. Where's the best place to begin the new year? Where is the... I'll give you another chance. Where is the best place to begin the new year 2024? Sounds good. Amen. When the devil hears the people of God speaking like that, he gets nervous. Amen. He gets scared because he knows that when the people of God are in the house of God and they're together in oneness and unity, and we are praying and committing our, our lives and our future in God's hands, he can't do a thing about it. He has to do like Job. He has to ask God's permission to touch us. And God will not allow you to be touched in any way, hallelujah, that he knows that you will not be able to overcome or get through. Amen? So we are going to be covering ourselves in the new year. I'm excited already about what God is doing and what he's going to do. And uh, looking forward to going over to the, to the Mayfair. So we are not going to keep you too long in the word today. But we have a few items. <coughs> of housekeeping. I see that we have some very, very uh, special guests in our house. We have Sister Rosemary in the house right here. Rosemary came. Rose. Oh, I'm sorry. Rosemary is her sister. Rosie. I'm mixing you up. They're twins, actually. <laughs> so forgive me. <laughs> Forgive me. Rosie's in House of the Lord, and she's came looking for Lady Cheryl. They worked together a number of years there, uh, and uh, she, she, Lady Cheryl, I know you're on. You, you are. You, you broke Rosie's heart because you're not here. But she was here earlier this morning. Uh, she wasn't well at all overnight. She came down with a cough, and uh, but she came to make sure that everything was in place for our trip to the Mayfair. That's, that's dedication, isn't it? Even though she wasn't feeling well, she got up and came here before me 
and brought the car back for me so that I can get back here. So some of you might have seen her, and, uh, and so I know that she would love to be here, but uh, I think it's best for her to stay and uh, get some rest and heal. So good to see Rosie, Rosie in the house of God. Also, it's a blessing to see someone we haven't seen in a long, long time. One of my co-workers, Brother Aaron Nichols. Brother Aaron Nichols, please stand. And Sister Nichols, Sister, Sister uh, Myrtle Nichols is in the house of God. Boy, what a blessing to see you all in the house of God today. These folks are actually literal miracles, living miracles. And they have experienced some, some trauma, similar to what my family has experienced uh, in the last couple of years. They lost their son. Uh, and uh, dramatically, and, uh, and so we have some things that in, in common. And we also have the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, who's able to keep us, hallelujah, who has been keeping us in common as well. And so, Brother Nichols, we thank God for you especially, and then Sister, Sister Myrtle, we, we, we've been in contact with Sister Myrtle because we couldn't get a hold of Brother Nichols. But we pray that you will stay in contact with us, and it's good to see you all in the house of God today. Also, the Powells are in the house of God. Please stand so we can recognize you. The Powell family. This is a family that has been uh, very busy, challenged with different situations as well, traveling and doing things, but I know that the, the girls have been coming once in a while in between, and we're glad to see you in the house of God today. God bless you. God bless you as well. And we have, of course, our first-time visitor. God bless you, sir. Good to have you in the house of the Lord. And all of you, we're happy to see. Come on, give yourselves a round of applause. Hallelujah. Sister, Sister Heather's birthday was yesterday. She reminded me today. So, Sister Heather, we're going to shout you out. God bless you, Sister Heather. Belated greetings. We pray that you have many, many more birthdays. And if you had a birthday recently or you have a birthday upcoming, we celebrate you as well. Just give me a wave. Yeah, yeah we see a birthday, a birthday today. God bless you, sis. Happy birthday. Brother Aaron's birthday as well. Friday. Sister Rhonda. It was Friday. Oh, your anniversary. I'm sorry. Congrats. How many years? I thought you said 60 years. <laughs> six, one six. Okay. Okay. That's beautiful. Beautiful, 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 beautiful. Beautiful. Well, I think I'm feeling family today. I'm really feeling family today. And I'm watching the clock. Good to see you in the house of God, Troy. Glad you made it in. Amen. And we give him all the glory and all the praise. You know, the family is on their way in. We welcome them as well. Well, let's get into the word because we do want to... Uh, the children are going to be dismissed as they prepare for um, their ministry next Sunday. And as, as, as customary, they always go off to uh, be ministered to at their level so they can understand comprehend and we are still we are still in need of more instructors and teachers in this ministry the, the children's church ministry uh, we have a small number of staff in this ministry and we don't want to overwork them but we we thank god for their dedication and we give god all the praise i'm grateful to the ministry of reverend sandra thank god for sister marcia and uh, everyone, Sister Hazel is back with us. Come on, let's give Sister Hazel. <laughs> Sister Hazel, you gave, us a, you gave us a good Christmas gift by coming back. <laughs> Amen. She went to visit her mom in, in, in Panama and decided to, that she needed to be back at Destiny. She missed Destiny too much. But she visited with her mom for her birthday. And uh, we thank God you're back safely. Well, glory to God. Glory to God. We can close here and go home, right? <laughs> Amen. Well, let's look into the Word of God, short word today. Continuing from where, what Reverend Sandra read earlier, in the book of Isaiah, in Isaiah chapter 7, reading from verse 10 to verse uh, 14. Yes, 14. 10 to 14. And if you have it, could you say amen? Let's stand on our feet as we give God's word. 
the honor that it is due. Praise the Lord. Amen. Brother Mark, we see you back there and your family. Thanks for bringing the family out. Amen. God bless you. And it reads thus. Again, the Lord spoke to Ahaz. Ask the Lord your God for a sign, whether in the deepest depths or in the highest heights. But Ahaz said, verse 12, I will not ask, I will not put the Lord to the test. Then Isaiah said, Hear now, you house of David, is it not enough to try the patience of humans? Will you try the patience of my God also? Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. A virgin will conceive and give birth to a son. And he will be called Emmanuel. Emmanuel. My topic today is our hope is Emmanuel. Shall we pray? Lord, we give you glory and praise for this gathering, this assembly of your people. We know, God, that your spirit is with us because your word says that wherever two or three persons gather in your name, that you are in our midst. Lord, we've come to hear from you, Lord, at this time. We've come to hear truth from your word. We pray, God, you will give wisdom and insight and unction right now that comes only through the Holy Spirit and cause the hearts of your people to be receptive. And we ask these things, oh God, that the change will, be, change will take place in the lives of individuals. And if there's anyone here who needs to know Christ as Emmanuel, a Savior, that their hearts will be receptive to your word. We come against the powers of darkness that will try to snatch and steal and distract from the word of God. And we pray, Lord, that freedom, freedom to speak forth your word and freedom to receive your word will take place even now. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. And everyone says, Amen. Amen. Our hope is Emmanuel. You may be seated at this time. And again, we greet the folks who are with us, our membership there in Canada, and those folks who are in Brooklyn, and other parts who have joined us and are joining us on YouTube. We welcome you, and we are happy to have you as well. Everywhere I go, everywhere I go, and if you, if you hang out with Pastor, you would, you would realize that wherever I go, whomever I meet, I am presenting Christ. It's not about me. It's not even about the church. It's about Jesus Christ. Do you know Jesus Christ? I intentionally enter into conversation, conversations with people about the conditions <clears throat> and times in which we are living. People everywhere and in every station in life seem to have given up hope. Oftentimes I meet people and they seem so pessimistic about the future. In many of our, our national institutions they are up they're pessimistic whether it is government whether it is education or even entertainment people are pessimistic about many things that are transpiring and unfolding around them today it seems like the, the only place where there's some optimism is in sports and that probably has to do with the Knicks because the Knicks seem to be doing well this year those of you who follow the Knicks I heard they're doing well I heard they're doing well? Yes, Better, right? Yes. <laughs> Someone is doing like this. <laughs> well, we have to wait till the finals. Who's going to get into the finals? Well, you can imagine that I'm not a big, big uh, sports fan necessarily. Uh, when I was much younger, 14 years old, I actually fractured or broke my ankle playing cricket. Since then, I determined that sports was not for me. <laughs> Whether to play or to watch too much of it. But then I heard the Knicks are doing a little better, and there's some optimism about something, all right? There's a sense of despair, even in religious circles, with attacks against Christians, attacks against Jews and Muslims, and the strife among these groups, and also because of the ongoing wars that are all over the news that we're hearing about, that we're hearing so much money is being spent on. You know, we, we, they don't have money to spend on education. They don't have money to spend on health care. 
They don't have money to spend on housing, but they have money to spend on foreign wars, not even to defend the homeland, but to spend on foreign wars. And people are, are becoming frustrated, yeah. right? All these institutions, okay, uh, and, and, and uh, seem to be under, that, that used to make, or that made America great, seem to be under attack. Even the integrity in our leaders it seem, seems to be under question, being questioned today. I mean, when you have to pull the president in and possibly f uh, file charges or possibly have hearings for criminal activity in that level of leadership, it questions, it, it leaves questions in our minds about everything down below. So the prophet Isaiah was called by God under similar circumstances in, in Judah, in Israel, among his people. He was called in uh, uh, when circum social situations and uh, religious experiences were similar. We heard last a few weeks ago about, about the exodus in the church. Over 40 million people have left attending church. They have, not, they have not left the Lord, all of them necessarily, but they no longer attend. They have no interest in being in the house of God in the last 25 years. This is where we are today. All right? And so a similar condition existed in Israel at this time. And Isaiah was called under these circumstances with an assignment to speak to the house of Judah. His message was simple and his message was clear to the people. Repent of your sin. Return to your God. And re renew your relationship with God. And I can just bring a message on those three themes today. Repent, return, and to renew your fellowship with the Lord. However, just as it was back then and, and that day, the message today is unpopular. <laughs> you know, back in, the, back in those days when the prophet spoke, some of them were put in prison, some of them were beaten, and thank God we're not living in those days as yet. But believe me, those days are coming when we will be persecuted for preaching the word of God, the truth of God's word. If you preach the truth of the culture, if you preach that which is politically correct, it will be accepted. But if you preach the truth as God's word states it, you will probably be, and you, we are being persecuted already. However, uh, it was unpopular. And uh, they turned from God, the people of God turned from God and they started following other idols and doing every, putting their trust in their material goods. However, Ahaz and Judah, Ahaz was the king of the southern kingdom at this time, was faced with a serious crisis. And it's outlined in chapter 7 of Isaiah verses 1 and 2 through to the, to the, to the section that we're going to cover today. And I want to pick up the reading here in verses 2. King Rezin of Aram... And Pekah, son of Ramalia, king of Israel. Now, Israel was the northern kingdom. Judah was the southern kingdom. Remember, the kingdoms were the, the kingdom was divided, all right, after uh, Solomon died under Rehoboam. Rehoboam, we're not going to get into that, but Rehoboam did some very uh, selfish things, wouldn't allow the people to have social freedom. And the kingdom of Israel was divided between uh, Israel in the north and Judah in the south. And the Bible says that uh, the king of the north joined with an ally to march up to fight against Judah, uh, Ahaz, in the south. But they could not overpower it because of God's hands of protection. Now the house of David, which is the south Judah, Aram was allied himself, had allied himself sorry, in, in the north, had allied himself with, A, with Ephraim. So the hearts of Ahab and the people were shaken as the trees in the forest were shaken, are shaken by the wind. So this threat, this threat of attack caused King Ahaz to be very fearful, be very nervous. The people were, were scared. In the time when Judah was facing eminent attack, it was a time when Judah was facing eminent attack by the northern kingdom and its allies. God speaks to the prophet Isaiah. It's as if uh, uh, Russia, 
as if Russia was about to come as they threatened Ukraine and they amassed their armies around Ukraine a few years ago, actually, and they were threatening the nation. It was a time like this. But we are under threat here in our nation by different circumstances. The family is under threat in our country. Financial uh, situation, security is under threat in our country. We have moral standards. Moral standards are under threat in our country. We have people that are being attacked in the streets just for being who they are. We are under threat in different ways. And so here we have that the, 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 the southern kingdom is faced with this attack. And uh, verses 3 to 10 tells us, The Lord says to Isaiah, Go out, you and your son, Shejeshub, which means a remnant will return, to meet Ahaz at the end of the aqueduct of the upper pool, on the road to the laundress field. Say to him, Isaiah, say to this king, my king, be careful. Keep calm and do not be afraid. Don't be afraid. Do not lose heart. God is saying to us today, as a child of God, you do not have to lose heart. He's saying to you today, keep calm. Do not react, but think and respond to your situations. If God is for you, who can be against you? And so... Uh, he says, do not lose heart because of these two smoldering snubs, stubs of, of, of firewood. In other words, the, the prophet is saying, listen, have you ever seen a barbecue? Have you ever seen the wood in the barbecue that's burning? <coughs> Excuse me. It's only a matter of time before that wood burns out. These two enemies that are coming against you, all right, will be burnt out very soon. They won't last too long. They're going to disintegrate into nothing just now. And the word of God to us today is, listen, the enemy may come against you, and he will come against you, but he cannot stand. He cannot get through you. He cannot get through the, bar, the barrier, the, bar, the borders, or the boundary that God has put up around his people. And so because of his fierce anger, Rezin and Aram, and of the son of Ramelia, uh, verse 5, Aram, Ephraim, and Ramelia's son have plotted your ruin. People may be plotting your ruin right now, but they have to get through God. And they may be saying, let us invade Judah. Let us tear it apart. Have you ever been in that situation where you know that someone wanted to tear you apart? Someone wanted to eat you alive. It could even be sickness. It doesn't have to be a person. All right? Let us tear it apart and divide it among ourselves and make the son of Tabeel king over it. Yet this is what the sovereign Lord said. Isaiah is still speaking prophetically to the king. Yet this is what the sovereign Lord says. Verse 7. It will not take place. The plans that the enemy has to destroy you will not take place. He may, cause, he may cause you to lose your son or your daughter and cause you to throw your faith into the fire. That, that, that destruction that the enemy has planned for you will not take place. He may cause you to lose your job. He may cause a division in your house. He may cause strife to come between you and family members. Listen, the destruction, the plans that the enemy has to divide you, to destroy you, will not take place. Isaiah is speaking to the children of God. He says here, it will not take place. It will not happen. For the head of Aram is, the, is Damascus, and the head of Damascus is only resin. Within 65 years, if Ephraim will be too shattered to be a people. That is the Assyrians. And God has ways of using people that he has destruction planned for them already to attack his people, to try his people, to test us. He, he called Pharaoh his servant. You listening? He called Nebuchadnezzar his servant. How could a wicked person be God's servant? God has ways of using even wicked people to fulfill his purpose and his plans in the life of his children. 
He's not going to take someone who's walking perfectly in his will to do wrong. He can take the one that is wrong and wicked already to try and to test you. You're listening now. He says here, you do not, um, the head of Ephraim is Samaria, and the head of Samaria is only Ramelia's son, Pekah. He says, you, if you do not stand firm on your faith, I repeat that again. If you do not stand firm on your faith, you will not stand at all. There comes a time in every believer's life when we will be tested. Despite the promise of, promises of God that he has declared upon you. Last year, as uh, I think Reverend Sandra was praying and reminding us, last year the Lord gave us a word here in this church that this year, 2023, will be a year of what? Overcoming. And we couldn't comprehend how in the world could we have a, a year of overcoming. But the one thing that I realized was that in order to overcome, there has to be something that you need to overcome. Which means God was preparing us for trials and troubles and tribulations, and disappointments and sicknesses and ailments and all kinds of things. But God was saying that we will overcome them by the end of the year. And so God was giving us a word of hope. And the thing is that because you are a child of God does not mean that you will not face adverse circumstances. Because you are a child of God it does not mean that the, the, the children in the house will not act up, or your husband may not act up, or your wife may not act up, or on the job they may not speak ill of you behind your back, or plot evil against you, or in your house, your neighborhood. It doesn't mean that you are exempt from the attacks of the enemy. Consider Job. Consider Job. But I thank God. I've been reminded of Job so much these days. Because first of all, Job had to, Satan had to get God's permission to touch Job. And God was boasting about Job. He said, listen, have you considered my boy Job? Speaking in, 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 in everyday language. Have you checked out Job? Job had his act together. Job was praying for his children day and night, just in case they may have sinned. He was offering offerings up to the Lord on their behalf. And don't, no doubt he was offering offerings on his own personal behalf as well. And we have to learn to build a, a barrier, build a fortress against the attacks of the enemy before the attacks come. This is why when the, when the enemy came and he took Job's children and his property, his possessions, Job was able to stand up and say, listen, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. His wife told him, listen, you serving God for nothing, you fool. Why don't you curse God and die? Job said, listen, you're talking like a real foolish woman. Should we take good from God and not expect adverse circumstances as well? This calls for faith. This calls for truly standing in firm in your faith. And this is what this verse 9 is telling us. If you do not stand in your faith, you will not stand at all. We have to stand when things are good. We have to stand when things are not so good. We have to stand when we have and when we don't have. We have to stand when we are in need and when we are blessed. We have to keep on standing. In all circumstances. I love what Paul said in Ephesians 6. He says, therefore, put on the full armor of God. Hallelujah. And listen, Job didn't have this text in his day. Huh? This king here Ahaz didn't have this text in this day. We have this text only since the church began after Pentecost that, that Paul wrote this, this, this letter to the Ephesians. He said, therefore put on the whole armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you will be able to stand your ground. Hallelujah. And after you have done everything, after you have done your part, after you've taken the shield of faith, after you've taken the sword of the spirit, after you taking the, sh the, the breath, the breath, the helmet of righteousness of salvation and the best breath of righteousness. After you've done all these things, all you need to do is to stand. Hallelujah. All you need to do is to stand. Stand. God has already promised victory over the enemy. 
all right? If only King Ahaz and Judah would stand. In other words, prophet, the prophet was saying, if only you would stand. But this king was prideful. Pride goes before what? Destruction. And a haughty spirit before a fall. This king was a foolish king. Because God had determined to protect Judah. God had determined, determined to, be, to stand with Judah. And, uh, and, and Isaiah was telling him, listen, go, go, go. Go and ask God for a sign. But he instead went ahead and he tried to bribe. If you read the account in 2 Kings chapter 16, go read it. 2 Kings 16 verse 8, there about. He went and got all of the gold and the silver items from in the house of God, from in the temple. And he took them to the king of Assyria to bribe him. Listen, you cannot bribe Satan. You cannot bribe Satan. Amen. Don't tell Satan, I can just, I'm going to just do it this time and not again. I'm only going to buy a certain amount of lottery tickets. I'm not going to buy as much as I used to buy. You can't bribe Satan, and you can't fool God. You are listening now? So this foolish king Ahaz tried to bribe the enemy. And when you study the text, the history of this event, we see, we see what the outcome was. You cannot bribe Satan. Now, in our text, we come to our text. We're not coming to our text. All right? Verse 10. Again, the Lord spoke to Ahaz. Ask, your, ask the Lord your God for a sign, whether in the deepest depths or in the highest heights. Throughout the scriptures, men and women of God have asked God for signs in critical times. We had Gideon. Gideon was called when, Israel, when, when, the, when the nation was being attacked by the Midianites. And God called Gideon and made him one of the judges in Israel. And, and Gideon was, he was, he, he was so, uh, he was so unassuming, never thought that God could use him in this manner. So he said, God, would you give me a sign to, to demonstrate that you are with me? And he, so he took a fleece of wool and he put it outside. God, allow the ground to be wet out with dew and allow the fleece of wool to be dry and I'll know that you are sending me. And, and God allowed the, the ground was wet and the, the fleece was dry. And then he came back and said, God, don't, don't, don't consider me to be presumptuous. I'm going to put the fleece out again. But this time, allow the fleece to be wet with dew, all right, and the ground to be dry. And it was so. And so God confirmed what he was about to do through Gideon by these signs. Another example was Hezekiah. Hezekiah was a good king of king. And Hezekiah became ill. And uh, he turned his face to the Lord. He said, God, would you please spare my life? Isaiah told him, you're going to die. Get your house in order. And he cried to the Lord. And, and as Isaiah was leaving the court of the temple, the Lord spoke. You see, the righteous cry out. And the Lord hears. If you got problems today, cry out to God. Hezekiah cried out to God. And before Isaiah got to the door, the exit of the temple, the Lord spoke to the prophet Isaiah said, Go back and tell Hezekiah, I have heard your prayers. He said, Before you call, I know what's in your heart. I've heard your cry. And while you're calling, I am responding to you. Maybe you have not responded, you have not got God's answer. You haven't received from God because you have not called on him. And, the, and Isaiah came back to the prophet, to the king, and said, listen, God has heard your prayer, and he says, I'm going to extend your life for another 15 years. Yeah. You know, I, I've, seen, I've, been, I've seen situations where people have been prayed for. People have been at the altar praying for certain situations, and God healed them instantaneously. And though they're at the altar praying for this situation, and God healed them, they turn and they say, I can't believe that God did this. That's the kind of God we serve. He works miraculously and instantaneously. And so when Hezekiah got the word that uh, God was going to heal him, he said, listen, I, I, I'm not convinced that this is going to happen. And he said, can I, I get a sign that this is going to happen? And he says, it's, it's, it's okay for the sun to go down, the shadow of the sun to go down as normal. 
But could, could God, could you allow the shadow of the sun to go backwards? It's like the sun normally goes from this way to the east to the west. But could you go, cause the sun God to go back this way? Could you imagine asking God to cause the sun to go back, maybe 10 hours back this way? Well, this is what Hezekiah said. And you know that God did it? Scientists, scientists have all, have, have confirmed that there's a time span of 10 hours that are missing in history. Because of this event here in the scriptures, and God allowed the sun to go back 10 steps on the, on the, on the steps of the temple, and, uh, and so it confirmed, it confirmed that God would extend Hezekiah's life. Now, we don't have to ha ask God for a sign about everything in our lives, because when God gives us his word, his word stands. He is gracious. Sometimes he doesn't do things when we want them. Sometimes he doesn't do the things that we want him to do. You listening? Because God knows what is best for us. How many know we can ask God for things that are not good for us? How many know you can ask God for things that are not the best thing for you? And then you have to come back to God and say, God, please take it away. Ouch. Now, it has, it has didn't ask God, he didn't ask God for the sign. He said, I will not ask, verse 12 to 13, I will, I will not put the Lord to the test. Then Isaiah said to him, hear now, you house of David, is it not enough to try the patience of humans? Will you, all, will you try the patience of God also? Ahaz refused to ask God for a sign because he was putting his confidence in King Assyria and the material things that he had taken out of the idol, the bribe that he was trying to bribe the enemy with. with. But God gave the sign nevertheless. And here's where we are. The sign that God gave, gave is Emmanuel. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. A virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. Emmanuel. Now, God has given to us a sign of his, of his hope. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is the sign of our deliverance. Listen, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is our hope, all right? And this was fulfilled in the birth of Jesus Christ. Matthew 1, 22 to 23 tells us it all took place, all this took place to fulfill what the Lord said to the prophet, the prophet Isaiah, the virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son and they will call him Emmanuel, which means what? God with us. Now note, Emmanuel is not the name of Jesus. Emmanuel, some of you, many of you have a second name, some of you have a third name besides your, your surname. Emmanuel is not the name of Jesus. It's not Jesus' middle name, all right? Some people may say, but Jesus' name might have been Jesus God. All right, but Emmanuel was not Jesus' Jesus' name. It is simply a description of who he is. Emmanuel is simply a description of who Jesus is. Now, some people call me Pastor. Is Pastor my name? No, Pastor is merely a description of the work that I do here in the church. So don't call me Paul Anderson Pastor Patrick. No, 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 no. My name is Paul Anderson Patrick, for those of you who may not have known. So Jesus is not Jesus Emmanuel whatever, all right? But it is the title of who he is. Pastor is merely the title. Jesus is, Jesus is God with us. Pastor is pastor here at this church, and this is what this means. Therefore, Emmanuel lets us know that God is with us, and this is significant. There was a time when God allowed worship, uh, when God uh, allowed uh, fellowship with Adam, sorry. God fellowship with Adam and Eve at certain times of the day, the book of Genesis tells us. 
There was a time when there was a time when Moses met with God at the burning bush, and then the Lord uh, followed or led the children of Israel out of bondage by by means of the pillar, of, the pillar of fire and the pillar of cloud and so forth. The power of the Spirit of God came upon people like 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 Samuel and Samson and David and and Elijah and enabled them to speak on behalf of God and to perform supernatural work. So God moved upon men at different times in history to cause them and inspire them to do significant things on his behalf. But here now, after the birth of Jesus Christ, we don't have God just coming and going. We have God coming and being with men. You're listening? This is what Christmas is all about. God being with us. For the skeptics who do not believe that Jesus is God with us, take a closer look at his life, all right? No one ever spoke the way Jesus did. It was the the testimony of the soldiers who went to arrest Jesus. And they came back and said, listen, we couldn't arrest him because no one has ever spoken like the way Jesus speaks, all right? Jesus, uh, no one ever uh, 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 brought life to a dead body the way Jesus did. And so no one ever, no one ever, ever brought the hope that Jesus has brought into the world as Jesus has done. He performed, he performed miracles that we can, they can only think about before. He walked on water. Who has ever walked on water before? Huh? Who has ever commanded the winds and the waves to cease, be calm, and the oceans became still? The winds stopped blowing. Hallelujah. Who has ever taken the two bread and fish and fed the multitudes of people that were around them? Hmm? Who has ever gone into a cemetery and waited till the body would stink and said, Lazarus, come forth? And if he didn't call, someone said, if he didn't call Lazarus by name, everyone in the cemetery would have gotten up that day that were dead in the grave. Huh? Who has ever done these things? No one has ever done these things because Jesus Christ is Emmanuel. He is God with us. Hallelujah. Many persons claim to have divine qualities, and they have started their own religions. They have died, and they are all in the grave. Think about Buddha, for example. Buddha was a great philosopher. Buddha is in the grave. Muhammad claimed to be a great prophet of God, and he is still in the grave. Confucius, he is still in the grave. Joseph Smith, he is still in his grave. Ellen G. White is still in the grave. But Jesus Christ, hallelujah, he laid his life down, and he came out of the grave on his own. Hallelujah. He laid his life down and he took it up again. <laughs> and Jesus Christ is the only one who can forgive sins. This is why the, day, the, 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 the religious people in his day were so baffled. They were, they were bamboozled by the fact that Jesus would look at a man who was let down through the roof of a building by his friends. And instead of Jesus laying hands on him and praying for him, instead of Jesus probably getting some anointing oil and and asking everyone to hold hands, Jesus says, listen, young man, your sins are forgiven you. And they say, who can forgive sins but God? They were confirming that Jesus Christ is God with us. Because no one can can forgive sins but God himself. He's the only one who can forgive sins. As I prepare to close, because God is with us, we can face every trial. We can face every storm. I don't know what you're dealing with today. I don't know what, if it is depression. I don't know if it's physical ailment. But I've come to let you know God wants you to. Listen, all I heard in this message was Emmanuel. I was saying to the Lord this week, Lord, Lord, what do you have for your people this week? And he said, Emmanuel. What what was God saying? I am with you. I am with you. Hallelujah. (laughs) Hallelujah. Because God is with us, we don't have to worry about the events that are unfolding in the world. Because God is with us, we don't have to fear the end, fear the final enemy. Our worst enemy is who? Death. 
Huh? And Jesus declared, I am the resurrection and the life. He said here, whoever believes in me will live. Even though they die, you don't have to fear death. We can look death in the face and say, oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, grave, where is your victory? He said, everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe in Christ? Raise your hand. If you believe in Christ, raise your hand. I have a word for you. You will never die. Because of that fact alone, we should walk with confidence. Because of that fact alone, we have this blessed hope. Our hope today is Emmanuel. You don't need a sign. You don't have to go read tea leaves. You don't have to go to the witch doctor. The sign has appeared. Hallelujah. The verdict is in. Jesus is God, and God is with us. Our hope is Emmanuel. God is with us, and our hope, hallelujah, of glory. He is God with us, and he is our hope of glory. Let's stand to our feet today. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Come on, let's give him some praise. Let's give him some praise. He is God with us. Because he is with us. He is working for us. And on top of that, on top of that, he's not only God with us, but he's God in us. He said, I go to the Father, and I will not leave you comfortless. But I will send the comforter. When he comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will be in you, not only with you, but he will be in you. I thank God that we don't have to go to a special place to talk to God. We don't even have to come to church to talk to God. Right there on your bed, you can commune with God. Hallelujah. If you put your hands in handcuffs and put you in prison, you can talk to God like Paul and Silas. Hallelujah. If you're in the hospital room, you can talk to God because his spirit is in us and we, are, we can commune with him. Let's give him some praise today. Let's give him some praise today. Lord, we are so grateful today. We are so grateful today for your wonderful plan of salvation. The sign has been given. The verdict is in. Jesus is with us. Jesus is God, and God is with us. Because you're with us, Lord, there's nothing, nothing that happens to us, that can happen to us without your planning. Your divine, your divine future, future uh, uh, knowledge about it. And so, Lord, we thank you today as we prepare to celebrate this season, as we continue in this season of celebration. Lord, we embrace this wonderful truth that God is with us. You've given us the greatest gift. You've given us yourself. You've come in the form of the little baby Jesus. And now, Lord, we have this blessed hope, this wonderful hope through Emmanuel. While our heads are bowed and eyes are closed, maybe you're here, you say, Pastor, would you pray for me? I do not know him as my Savior, and I want to invite him into my life this season. Listen, I invited Christ into my life around this season almost, almost uh, 48 years ago. That's how old I am. Not 48, but almost 48 years ago. And I want to tell you, it was the best decision I ever made in my life. I always remember the season. It was the best Christmas that I had that year in my whole life. And if you're here today and you have not accepted Christ as your Savior, you can have the best Christmas this year by inviting Christ to be the Lord of your life. Just slip your hand right where you are. Just slip your hand right where you are. Is there one person? Is there one person who say, yes, Pastor, I need to know Christ as my Savior? And uh, for those of you who know him as your Savior, and you want to make Christ a greater reality in your life, you want him to be near, you want to have his, you want to feel his presence near to you because he's with us. I want you to lift your hand right where you are. You're a believer already, but you want Christ to be felt and sensed nearer to you in this season. I want to pray a special prayer for you. God, you see the hands of your people right now. 
Your people want to sense your presence in a greater way, Lord. I pray even now, God, you will give them a desire to seek after you, to hunger and thirst after you, that they will not allow the material things and the festive activities of the season to, 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 to gain the attention that they need to give to you, that they will make you, we will make you our priority this season. That, Lord, we will spend time in your presence, spend time in your word. We will spend time sharing you with others so that people, others will know, too, that God has given his best, and God is with us even in this season. Bless us today, Lord, even as we leave this house, cover every family member. Lord, I pray that you will minister to every need, Lord God, represented in this house today. Touch bodies. Touch bodies that are sick. Heal them, O oh God. Minister to financial situations today, O oh God. Turn circumstances around in relationships among husbands and wives, among children and their parents, Lord God. I pray, God, that you will move in every house in this season. Show yourself to be mighty. Show yourself to be real. And we give you thanks and praises for doing all these things in Jesus' mighty name. And everyone says, come on, let's clap our hands. God bless you. God bless you. Remember, remember, have hope. Take hope. Take hope. Take hope because of Emmanuel. Because of Emmanuel. Because God is with us. God bless you. Have a precious remainder of the day and the week in the Lord. Praise God. Blessings, blessings. We are going to Mayfair at 2 o'clock, 2 o'clock. All right, if you can have a quick lunch, you can join us. God bless you.